the first problem is where to plant your pole. The North Pole is on a constantly moving sea of ice, so where the pole is now may not be where the pole is in an hour's time. That's why, as the Americans might say, once you've got it, flaunt it. This is it. I'm standing on the top of the world at the North Pole, where the time is, well, the time's anything you want it to be up here. The temperature's about minus 25 degrees centigrade, so there's no point in hanging around. What I'm going to do is make a journey from here to the South Pole, which is you know, in every direction. If I went that way, I'd go down through Japan. If I went that way, I'd go down through India. But we've chosen a route that way, 30 degrees east, line of longitude, down through Russia and Africa. It's going to be a hell of a long journey, but, uh, well, let's go. I hadn't expected things to be such a rush. The pilot won't risk turning his engines off in the bitter cold. Though I'd quite like to sit and write a few postcards, he wants to be off while we still have enough fuel left. And you don't argue with the pilot. Not at the North Pole. The plane we're in was designed in the 1950s. Our lives depend on it. There are no airstrips, no control towers, no emergency vehicles below us. There is rapidly changing weather, intense cold and hundreds of miles of frozen ocean. And this is just the beginning. We've chosen the 30 degree east line of longitude simply because it covers the most land, running through Scandinavia and the great cities of St. Petersburg, Istanbul and Cairo. We'll be traveling down the River Nile, across the desert to Khartoum and on to Lake Tanganyika and Cape Town from one extreme of the earth to the other. Even if everything works, we have almost half a year's traveling ahead of us. After 13 hours flying over the Arctic Ocean, the sight of the tiny settlement of Nialisund on the island of Spitsbergen is an indescribable relief. Many Arctic expeditions began here, and some, including Amundsen's last flight, never returned. We ourselves touch down with only minutes worth of fuel left. We may not quite have run out of fuel, but we have run out of good weather. There's nothing to do but wait, and waiting, they tell me, is what the Arctic is all about. It's two days before the blizzards let up. We've made it an unwritten rule of the journey not to use air transport where there's any possible alternative. And the only alternative out of Nialisund is by the modern equivalent of dogs and sledges, snowmobiles and sledges. 